I think art is anything you do well. And most people are artists of one sort or of another. I'm an artist and an emeritus professor of architecture, and I taught at the University of Florida for 35 years. I also have a Master of Fine Arts degree in sculpture. I've been quoted as saying, art is its own reward. And really what I mean is making art is its own reward. I don't have to sell it. I don't have to get famous for it. I'm not doing it to get rich. I do it because it's something I'd rather do more than anything else I can think of. I've been doing art ever since I was a kid. I remember being a child and stringing uh, almost a human spider web of string around the house that required people to get around and participate with my work. And I still do that today. That's still part of my main philosophy is to involve people with the sculpture or with the vessels with whatever I make. I see creating sculpture the same way as I see creating architecture. This idea of involving people with my art has been with me for many, many years. So I started to think about working with light, inspired by a glow-in-the-dark frisbee. And I decided if I can make art glow-in-the-dark, that would be interesting. But I went to a place here in Gainesville, Florida, or near a lake where there's been thousands of years of Indians living. And I decided we needed a new tribe that would make these arrowheads and put them back in the ground, not just take them out like everybody else does. And I, they weren't finding, people weren't finding these arrowheads, and so I decided to make them glow in the dark. So at night they would glow a bright blue or a greenish blue, and during the day, they were the same color as the other arrowheads that you would find. So people were responding to the artwork in a way it was anonymous, uh, environmental art. And it made me very happy to think about these friends, almost a community of people who have these arrowheads, going to bed at night and seeing a glowing spot in their room. The, uh, the idea behind interacting art is to make the people who see it part of the art form. I'm an environmentalist and I am inspired by the trees and the plants and the birds and the animals, the fauna and flora we would call it, and that has been the inspiration for my work. So almost everything I do can be looked at not only responding to people but responding to nature. Here's one of my environmental vessels. Um, it's a bird's nest. And on this property, I have a flock of peacocks and peahens. I have a flock of geese, a gaggle of geese. And they were all making nests and I felt left out. I was jealous. And so I made these nests myself. Um, this is one of many. Um, in any case, some of them were a lot larger. And I felt like I was doing the right thing when I left them outside by mistake and found a bird sitting in it. This is a portrait pie. It's a portrait of my land. And this here is my house, which is on the edge of a lake. And this here is the studio that I'm in here in now. And these other forms are the landscape surrounding, that is the live oak trees that are near the surface of the, the edge of the prairie, the edge of the lake. It's called Grassy Lake, but it's really a prairie. And these other ones are a different kind of oak, the laurel oaks that are on the rear part of the property. So when I see this, I see me, I see my property, I see a portrait of the place that I live. What we have here are two planetary landscapes. They're two visions of the earth. And this is the Pythagorean vision. He was the first uh, person uh, that had written about the art of the earth being a sphere and we all living on this sphere. He said that because uh, he looked in the sky and saw spheres and the other stars and planets, but he also thought spheres were the most beautiful form. Now what we have here is the opposite idea there was a group here in Florida called Corsian Unity, and they lived here in the late 1800s in Estero, Florida, and they had believed that we, that we were in the sphere, but we live inside the sphere. We live on the inside 
of the uh, edge of, of the sphere. And we look up in the center, and the center was the sun, actually suspended in the center. And so they have this opposite idea. Almost all my work relates to nature. And the sculpture involves different kinds of landscapes. And so what we have are landscapes here that are sacred. We have landscapes that are uh, different types. One is uh, a saddle landscape where we have higher, low areas. Uh, other kinds of landscapes that are habitable landscapes. Now essentially, uh, they are nature, different kinds of nature. The vessels are the very same. In other words, when I make a, a bowl, it, it usually has a name just like sculpture, and it's usually inspired by a particular landscape. Instead of doing 10 different repeating landscapes, I have the same one done 10 different times. And each one gives me some possibility. So I make a mold of this one and make 10 of the same thing. So that it's not involving a different idea. It's involving what happens when you put, when you, when you have uh, the same form using the, the technology of the glaze in different manners. Each part of the piece has its own iridescence. I'm trying to deal with the light and sculpt not only with the clay form itself, but the light. For me, making art is a solitary experience. In other words, I'm alone when I do the work. Uh, people don't really see it until it's finished, and indeed it may be in, not until it's in another gallery opening or, or one of my own studio openings. It takes this discipline, and the discipline is important, and it's something I do every day. I don't feel if I'm me unless, unless I make some art that day, and if I miss doing it, I resent whether other activity has interfered with me and the things I love. If you look around this room, you'll see a lot of blue. I like that blue. It was inspired by the blue on the back of a peacock's neck. And it took me many years to do, and it has a wonderful iridescence to it. But I have friends who like the pinks and the reds of my art, and here is one of those. And if you look closely, you can see a light blue iridescence, you can see a gold iridescence, you can see a violet iridescence on the edge. And it all just depends on the light. This is a copper glaze, and I love it because it's so bright and so strong. And the name of this piece is something like uh, Florida Summer, a uh, hot summer piece. This is one of a series called Inhabited Landscapes. And so here we have nature and architecture coming together. And you can, you can look at this piece and almost imagine yourself in this form that lifts itself up above nature and, and oversees the, the crater part that's part of it. I believe you start at the essence. You start at the beginning, creating the tool before the art is ever made. And so I built this structure, a 3,500 square foot studio, three stories tall, to make the art, to make it the beautiful, to adapt to whatever I need to do in, in the artistic process. I need to start from scratch. And the scratch is to create the glaze that does the kind of thing I want to do for that particular piece. I usually use a layering of at least three glazes, sometimes five or six on the same piece. And that, that gives me a, 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 like an artist's a palette that doesn't want to just do a design with one color, but I can mix the colors as I need. I can create the different ideas. For instance, where there's a valley might be a different color than where there's a ridge. I could create not only the color, but the light. And because it's super reflective, it reflects the environment, it reflects the person looking at the art. If you're looking at it today with a blue shirt, it's going to be different than if you look at it when you have a white shirt. And so what we have is another kind of interaction, not just the light, but the reflection of the person looking at it. Natural light changes all the time. Even when the sun goes behind a cloud, we have a different color of light and then a different reflection. 
a different interaction with, with the art piece. Now, iridescence is not limited to, to, to art, obviously. Uh, I'm really interested in this, in flowers, in insects. You've all had maybe a tropical fish, the neon tetras, uh, other fish, the beautiful fish that have their own sheen, their own iridescence to them. And I feel like I'm in good company when I emulate their iridescence in my work. When my artist friends say, Ira, uh, don't you have enough glazes? You've done 3,000 tests. I mean, why don't you keep, why do you keep doing it? Well, it's part of not the insanity of doing something over and over again, it's the dedication. Because some of the best ones that I found are the most recent. The thing is that glazes are alive. Because I look in there, it changes. It's never the same. Every day it's different. Every light is different. Every morning it's different. And so it, it's like walking, was it, what was that saying about never being able to step in the same stream twice? Because it's always evolving, it's changing. And the, the art does that as well. And because of that, I think it becomes more involved with people's life. It becomes more involved. They see different beauty every day. And this idea of iridescence being a kind of alchemy has existed for the last 500 years. And alchemists never, never disclosed their secrets. Some of them died rather than disclose their secret. And I feel very much like the artists of the past uh, I don't know if I'd die for it, but at, at this point, I really think the, the uh, I'd, I'd like to keep the secrets my own, how I make this stuff, until I get the uh, rewards and recognition that I'm looking for. My greatest joy is seeing the art come to fruition, but it's even more enhanced when I see other people appreciate its beauty.